Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, uh, so my session is focused on some of the clinical pearls uh, for managing patients with atypical nevi and melanomas. My objective is threefold. Uh, one is highlighting some of the challenges in managing this group of patients and uh, also showcase some of the clinical process to improve outcome. And lastly, the bulk of the talk will be focused on highlight and pitfalls uh, dealing with difficult lesions. Now, when we think about historically, traditionally, when thinking about melanoma, this is the type of images that you see in textbooks, right? But in reality, the matter is uh, we no longer see those kind of images you know, with the use of demoscopy, other advanced technology, you are able to pick up early melanomas that don't really have any of the ABCDE features. Uh, some of those lesions I'm showing you that are less than two, three millimeters in size. Now, what makes melanoma really difficult is the fact that it can look like a whole bunch of different things, right? And what is also difficult is you're dealing with a lot of challenging patients. So those are two examples of my patients. What you see on the left is, uh, let's see, how do you use the mouse? Uh, so what do you see on the left is you got individuals uh, that have more than 100 nevi's on the back, right? And uh, it's very, very difficult to pick up any of those lesions, pick up a melanoma in a sea of atypical nevi. And on the right, you have an individual that have maybe um, 50, 60 nevi's, and a large number of them have a lesion that's a greater than 1.52 centimeters in size. And what's really interesting is that melanoma usually uh, arise de novo, meaning that they do not arrive within the pre-existing nevi's. So only 15% uh, of the lesions melanoma arrive within previous atypical nevi. Majority actually arise from de novo areas. So how do you pick that up? Now what is even more challenging dealing with those patients is the idea, some of the patients uh, sometimes can be hostile and angry, and large part of it they're just afraid. And some of them are just the research column, the research zealot, they will come in with uh, reams of document that Google print out and telling you how to do things. And some patient will come in and telling you just take them off because I'm so scared, just take all of them off. And other people are just like, they're completely panic-stricken, and whatever you try to explain to them, and they don't really get it. They don't really understand, right? Uh, other patients just don't, don't care. Other patients just, you know, there's no time to treat, in a sense. So the number one complaint also a lot of people get, uh, the patient I'm hearing from is, you know, I ask them, why do you come? Why do you see us? It's the fact that they complain that the exam is too quick. It's not thorough enough, okay? And to complicate the issue, um, melanoma happened to be one of the big uh, litigious issue. About 14% of all claims in, in 1985 to 2011 involved misdiagnosis of melanoma. 32% gets a paid out. Average payment is about a million dollars. That was about 15, 20 years ago. Now, the question is, what process can you implement that allows you to not miss a melanoma and also allow you not to over biopsy those lesions. And you can't really go too fast with the exam, but you can't go too slow, otherwise you're just gonna bog down your entire clinic. And also, the most important thing is how do you convey the diagnosis and win the trust and allow your patient to trust you and build the compliance, right? So this is a kind of quick explanation. And a lot of times when we think about this, you know, we're thinking about your consultation process, right? And what happened when you actually come into your office? And this is the part right here, the consultation process. You know, you have to take the history, take the exam, you go about the process, right? And you educate them. Once you make the diagnosis, you have to figure out how to treat it. But I want you to start thinking beyond that zone right there, right? Your interaction with your patient really sort of starts back in the exam room, your waiting room, and the first contact, and the online process, right? And that entire chain is what really makes a difference. And I can't really emphasize this long enough. I've been practicing for about 15 years now. More and more I realize the sooner the better you can control that entire process, you were able to communicate better with your patient. 
Now, what I do, I give you a really quick rundown. So, you know, obviously you have to do the whole exam. Without that, uh, you're not going to be able to find the melanoma. So we always provide some comforting. We give them a gown to change and uh, some towel if they feel like really cold. And what I end up doing is when I walk into the room, I always sort of sit down. The reason for us sitting down is you try to run around, you're seeing 35 patients a day, and you're just running from one room to the next room to the next room, right? And what happens is you go into the room, you're in a kind of rushed mode. And the patient's going to complain to you, be like, he didn't spend enough time with me. And what I end up doing is I just sit down. By sitting down, instinctively, I'm sort of slowing myself down, in a sense, right? And then what I do is I ask them some questions, find out what's going on, and I start the exam. My exam always start the same way. I always start out with the right hand, OK? And I talk to them. And then I move on to the back and uh, the legs. And if they have history of uh, melanoma, I put on the gloves, check the lymph node. Then I, take my, then I look at the bottom of the toes, between the toe webs. And then I take my gloves off, look at the face, and look at the scalp. Right? I do this kind of a sequence. The reason why it is uh, you can interact with the patient. You can talk to them. And, and at the same time, the patient will sometimes come in with a list of lesions. They'd be like, look, I got this list of lesions, right? I really don't care, mainly because most of those lesions they find is SKs, right? And the lesion they're really worried about is the one that it's not on the list. So what I do is I take that list away from the hand, I read the entire lesion to them really quickly, and I go about my business, right? And I do this the same way every single time because that way it becomes automatic. You don't really have to think about it, okay? Next, demoscopy. We're going to talk about that demoscopy. In the hands of experienced user, you can enhance the diagnostic accuracy by 15 to 20 percent, no, 80, about 15, 20, 20 percent. But if you just start using it, your diagnostic accuracy actually drop. So tomorrow morning at 7.30, I will have a two-hour demoscopy session. And, um, um, and the goal is very simple, right? Two hours, you can't do much. But what my goal is, I'm going to basically get all of you, whoever comes, to able to diagnose, improve the diagnostic accuracy and the confidence in three seconds, right? In three seconds, you should be able to get the diagnosis. Afterwards, that's my goal. So hope to see many of you guys. Here are some of the tricks, clues, right? Something called ugly duckling. The idea is moles breathe true. That is, if you have lots of moles, every single one of those moles should look similar to each other, right? If you see a mole that is, looks different, and that is a mole you should pay attention to. So you have an example in which one mole is a lot bigger, uh, one mole has different color, or just isolated solitary lesion. That's from the clinical aspect. But let me show you some example of demoscopy. Here's a guy who has a history of melanoma on the back, on the back right here. And what ended up happening is, is you look at demoscopy, they all look the same, have pigment network, pigment network, pigment network, then bang, this lesion shows up. All right? This lesion looks totally different from any other lesion. If you don't even know anything about melanoma, don't even know anything about demoscopy, this is a lesion you should pay attention to. All right? Next. Now, here's another interesting ugly ducking lesion. So 47-year-old woman had a full history, of, full history of full melanoma present with this lesion. It's reported to be a little bit changing, all right? And this is a clinical and demoscopy. So what you see here, there is some uh, atypical network and uh, some uh, asymmetrical localization of dots, all right? So this is a concerning lesion. So the lesion was excised and it showed up as 0.8 millimeter uh, melanoma. This patient actually had a stage three lymph node, right? But if you use some imagination, right, what does this lesion look like? Hold on a second, let me go back. It kind of looked like an ugly duck, yeah? Yeah. So I, I put it in just for humoring purposes. So like this is like ugly duck lesion, right? But so going forward, right? Some other tools we have is total body photography. And uh, here's a lesion that's been followed for some time. The lesion has changed in shape and size. Biopsy came back as a melanoma, right? Now, here's something that's very, very important. That this is a study that basically showed that, you know, when you use a dermoscope in, incorporated into practice, doing a total body exam, it really doesn't take that much time. Um, this is a study showing that, you know, in the specialized clinic, and when you go through a whole body and it takes less than two minutes, right? But that is why patients complain sometimes about it's going too fast, right? 
Now, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about major pitfalls, all right? And I'm going to talk about four challenging lesions and also touch upon a little bit about the histology issues. Now, the first one is what I call a featureless lesion, all right? So I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of cases, and within that, hopefully, you get some pearls from it. So this is a 61-year-old man who came to me uh, for the first time with this lesion right here. Um, and let me see if it's, it's, it's not very clear. It's right here. I can't really see it that well. And he had a history of melanoma in situ. The first thing you see on his arm is that within that small sector, small zone right there, and he has lots of actinic damage, lots of moles, right? So I end up asking him, like, I, I always have the habit of asking everyone, what do you do? He's like, I'm a lawyer. So it's like, what kind of law do you practice? Malpractice. <laughs> All right. So, so then, then I was like, okay, better be more cautious, right? So, um, and uh, I hope I can show you this. I mean, uh, I don't know how to use the mouse in the back to show you both of it. It is this, it's this lesion. Let me go back. It's this, like, it's somewhere right here, this lesion. And in, for you guys right here, it's this lesion right here, right? It's a very, very thin lesion. And clinical demoscopy. You really can't see much, right? But what is really interesting is if you zoom in on one of those areas, what you see is a, a dotted vessels, okay? And I was worried about enough of this lesion. I think this could be a severe atypical nevi or melanoma, right? Instead of doing a shea biopsy, what I did was excise the whole lesion. Now, we can talk about different way to biopsy lesions. So the reason I did that is because I thought, you know, I was worried enough about this, and let me just excise it, because I think if it's a melanoma, if it's, in, I was thinking more or less a severe typical nevi, if I excise it, achieve wide margin, he's done, right? And to me, as a mole surgeon, or a suite is set up to do that kind of excision, we can finish by the time you put the gloves on, put the gloves off, it's less than five, seven minutes, you can get it done, right? Now, surprise me was melanoma in situ 0.22 breast load thickness, okay? Next lesion. This is a woman I saw when I first started practicing 67, it's 15 years ago. Uh, it came to me, and 67, now she's like almost 82. At that time, when she first came to see me, she had like 22 melanoma. I've subsequently picked up 15 more, all right? So this is one of the lesion, and she says she's changing. And clinical demoscopy, you don't really see much, right? And But what you end up seeing is this area where you see this kind of an atypical network in the center surrounding for it, there's kind of a featureless area. Featureless meaning there's no structures, nothing. And this lesion was shea biopsy and came back as melanoma in situ, right? Now, here's the thing I want to emphasize. That is, I'm showing you those featureless lesion, you may be terrified. You'd be like, good God, what am I missing, right? Here's the one good thing, good news that I want to share with you. That is, there's a lot of times when you first meet the patient, you're not going to be able to tell, right? This is a study that demonstrates in the beginning when they biopsy those, when they follow, the, the, they digitally, dermoscopically follow those patients, this is baseline, and a few months later, the lesion changed, that's when they biopsy, that's when they find the melanoma, okay? So the idea is um, focused on structureless area. Structureless area is something that is a comprised about 10, less than 10, 15% of the areas, and uh, it represents effacement of the reedy ridges. And if you incorporate that in your diagnostic uh, algorithm, you can actually improve picking up early melanoma. And here's something else, some other features. Uh, red dotted blood vessels, okay? Now, if, depending on the scope you use, if you have a polarized scope, you allow you to see the vessels much better. If you're using non-contact, it also allow you to see the vessels better because you're not compressing on it, you're not blanching out the lesion, all right? Now, here's something very, very important, what I was trying to get to earlier. That is, when we think about melanoma, they are not all the same, all right? We sort of tend to pat ourselves in the back. We're like, yes, I picked up a melanoma inside you. I saved your life, right? But the reality is those kind of melanoma is really not going to do any harm to a patient, right? So here's something else that is very important. That is, if you have a lesion that is early lesions, and they tend to spread very, very, very slowly, 
okay? And those are the type of lesions, they're really not gonna do any harm for the patient. But the lesion that's actually gonna really be damaging, really gonna do your patient's harm is nodule, okay? Now, here's the a, here's a first clue. That is, if you see a lesion, you don't know what that is. If it's a nodule, take it off, okay? Because that nodular lesion is gonna kill your patient, all right? Next one, small lesions. Small lesions are very difficult. I'll give you a couple of examples. This is a 54-year-old woman present with a, like, a little tiny dot of lesion right in the uh, nose right here. And uh, this is clinical dermoscopy. It's about one millimeter. And uh, she was worried she had melanoma. So this lesion was biopsied. And uh, so dermoscopy cl clinically and, um, excuse me, well, the melopathologists basically show that this is spindle cell melanoma, and they can't tell between this is spindle cell versus invasive melanoma. The reason why it is difficult for us is because the lesion is so small, you can't really see that much morphology. That's the same reason that pathologists are having trouble, because they can't really see the architectural the, 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 the symmetry and everything else. Right? That's why they're afraid as well. Clinical dermoscopy. So what we did, we did a fish analysis, and this lesion was not a melanoma. Okay, here's another lesion. 69-year-old guy with a lesion, clinical dermoscopy, and you can see this has a kind of atypical network, but it doesn't really have like kind of overblown dermoscopic features of melanoma, right? And this lesion was subsequently biopsied, and it showed it was a melanoma 0.45, okay? Here's another lesion. This is a combined nevus, okay? And it's all about, about two millimeter in size. Here's one more lesion. And, um, of a gentleman who had a history of uh, a metastatic melanoma present with a bluish like macule or nodule on the forehead. And if it wasn't for the history of metastatic melanoma on if, uh, previously treated with ipilimumab, you can think this could be a blue nevus, okay? Clinical dermoscopy, this is what you're seeing, less than a millimeter. It could be a tattoo, it could be a blue nevus, it could be anything, right? And this was biopsy, they showed a metastatic melanoma, right? So the, the challenge here is for small, small lesions, it is very difficult, okay? And uh, it is difficult for us because we don't have enough morphology based on dermoscopy to tell you what it is. And also, this is the same reason it is very difficult for the pathologist. And this is a study that basically showcased that. This is done about almost 12, 13 years ago. And they looked at whole, they took a whole bunch of um, experts and compared to a machine vision. And both the time it shows that for small lesion, the experts actually tend to miss those early melanomas. Now, Next set of lesions called the collision lesions, all right? Here, the idea of collision lesion is that you have two or more of a benign or malignant neoplasm arising within the same lesions, okay? Now, here's an example. Um, so when you look at this lesion, and what your or eyes tend to focus on is this area right here in the center, okay? And for you guys right there, it's right here. So, a few of the things you see is you see milli-like cysts and comedon-like opening. Those are the two features that are very indicative of subary keratosis, okay? So if you sort of, your eyes locked in on that center part of the lesions, and if you're in a rush, you tend to ignore all the periphery stuff, right? So you call this a subary keratosis, you move on. But if you ask yourself, you slow it down a little bit, you say, what are all this stuff on the side? And what are all this stuff right here, right? And then if you go one step further, if you basically said, I'm gonna basically block out this stuff, what are the other stuff around it, okay? If you look at it and you see there's some atypical network right there, okay? And um, you see some dotted vessels, okay? And so this, actually turn out to be a collision lesion of a subary keratosis and lenticle malignant, all right? So is that a surprise? No, because you can have a lot of SK colliding with lenticle malignant and basal cell skin cancers. It's very simple, because who gets SK? It's the elderly patient, sun-exposed site, right? Who gets a lenticle malignant? It's also the sun-exposed site and elderly patient, right? So probability-wise, you can have those collision lesions. So here, what you want to do is, the idea is avoid what's called the anchoring bias, avoid the search error. That is, if you see something in the middle, look around and don't ignore it. Last thing, 
what's called a black swan lesion. So the name is sort of taken from this book, um, Nassam Talib. He wrote this in 2008 during the financial crisis. It's talking about the impact of really low probability event, but that have a huge magnitude of impact. Like, what are we dealing with COVID right now, right? So tomorrow, when we, if those of you are inclined to show up, I'm gonna teach you about the patterns associated with benign lesions, all right? And uh, I say inclined because it is 7.30 in the morning. And uh, I don't know how hard you guys are gonna party tonight. But, so those are the benign features, okay? If you see one of those benign patterns, you're dealing with a benign nevi, okay? Now, what ended up happening is, so this is a patient that we saw, right? And uh, a lesion that has a purely network pattern. It looks like one of those patterns right here. It have two axis of symmetry, very few colors. You looked at it, it's very soothing. Should be a benign lesion, right? But for whatever reason, we don't remember the patient wanted this to remove, it was removed. It came back as melanoma in situ, okay? All right, so the question is, did we miss the melanoma? Is there any harm to be done? And my feeling is, no, not at all, even if you leave this lesion right there, right? Because I said before, you can follow those early superficial spreading lesions for a long time. They don't tend to spread very far, very fast. And those are the lesion that's not gonna kill your patient, right? It is what kind of lesion that you're gonna be worried about? Thank you. Now, here's another lesion, right? This is the lesion that have baseline image, okay? And four months later, a month later, right? It looks ugly, it changed, right? When you do the biopsy on this stuff, it came back as a compound clock nevus or just atypical nevus, right? So the, the, the moral of the story is that, you know, on rare occasion, nature fools us, right? And there are always exceptions to those rules. So just be mindful of that. Last point, I think this is a very, very important point. And for those of you uh, are managing patients like this, you got to understand your pathologist. You have to challenge, talk, and discuss with your pathologist, all right? What I mean is, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. Histology, I call it the fuzzy gold standard. This is the only gold standard we got right now, right? But and there's a lot of issues with it. Um, there's a lot of lesions that clinically, dermoscopically, even histologically, they're just challenging, all right? So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. So this is a 33-year-old woman with a history of two invasive melanoma, multiple nevi, and they had this lesion biopsied right here. And this is clinical dermoscopy, okay? So what do you see is, um, you see this in the, in the center, there's a kind of hyperpigmented area surrounding it, and there's all this kind of large globules around it, okay? Now, this lesion is actually a little bit different from some of other lesions that have a pattern suggestive, like, uh, this is another type of pattern that you see, network with very, very small little dots, okay? The difference between this kind of lesion and this kind of lesion, one is this is really, really dark, and the globules are a lot bigger, whereas this is just a network with dots, okay? This pattern right here is seen with adolescent. As the body start to expand, and you will see those kind of network with dots around it. And if you leave those guys long enough, you've tracked those lesions long enough, the dots will fade and the lesion will expand, okay? So, so uh, coming back so to this lesion, we biopsied it, and uh, this is the histological description, pigmented spindle epithelial melanocytes with architectural disorder, moderate tibia, and inflammation. And the pathologist, um, and um, basically uh, called it, and uh, they, they, they were having some trouble in trying to figure out what this is. And uh, it was sitting on the fence, basically. They couldn't know it's a melanoma or something else. And that's why we had to do fish analysis. They came back almost like spitzoid feature lesions. And so this lesion was subsequently removed. Now here's another one, 20-year-old woman with this lesion on the back. And the lesion has subsequently got bigger and she also got a tattoo. Um, and clinical dermoscopy, and you can see this is also one example have central hyperpigmentation surrounding globules to it. Now if you compare to those three type of lesion, there is kind of similarity, but there's a little bit of difference, right? 
Now, what happened was this is the histology, and when we submitted the path, the pathologist called that lesion is melanoma 0.6 millimeter, right? So at that point, we were like, well, I don't really think that's a melanoma, right? Because if you look at it, and it just doesn't have the feature, so it's a gut instinct in telling me it just doesn't look like a melanoma. So what we did was, you know, luckily at our center, we had those kind of, uh, um, every week we had this kind of, uh, um, during past session, we review photos, look at dermoscopy, everything else, and the diagnosis was subsequently reversed, all right? And we also did a fish analysis, and they call that as a kind of not a melanoma. Because it matters because, you know, um, first, it's an excision, like two, three millimeters excision versus a centimeter wide excision, right? And also, what's more important is psychologically for that patient. A 33-year-old woman thinking that she has a melanoma, it would change the, her, her, her outlook, right? And that one week of waiting for the diagnosis, it's heart-wrenching and it's fearful, right? And when they, every time they come in, and that aspect of it cannot be ignored, right? So, again, Gold standard pathology is really not the gold standard. Nature is not a binary system, and there are lesions that's just challenging histologically, dermoscopically, histolo and, and, and also clinically. And we don't really know a lot of times the biological behavior of those lesions. And luckily, you know, we have other additional tools like the, the tape stripping and castle bioscience to, for predicting the outcome and the aggressive nature of those stuff. It's coming, right? So. And as I wrap up this talk, um, I want you to sort of think about this in the context of we taking care of patients, right? I'm focused on the aspect of melanoma, but this principle, what I'm going to talk about, applies to everything. What you really need is, you know, what is our process, right? We go through a history, and uh, we do an exam. And there's this kind of analytical evaluation, and there's and you come up with a differential uh, diagnosis, right? But what you really want to do is when you see a lesion clinically, you should form a differential diagnosis. And then what you need to do is you got to put a scope on that patient and look at it. Does that dermoscopic diagnosis match with the clinical diagnosis? If it doesn't, you got to stop. Okay. That is very, very important. And a lot of times what we do is this gestalt, right? This gestalt of thinking about it. And there's something to be about the pattern analysis, your gut feeling, and how do you check the lesion. And you have to sort of wrap around this whole context of looking at patients, how to manage them, right? So here are some of the pearls I'm gonna leave with you. One, I think perhaps the most important thing is don't monitor any nodular lesions because those are the ones that's going to do harm to your patient. Two, beware of pink lesions, all right, looking for vessel morphologies. And that's how you're going to pick up early melanomas. And three, uh, the idea of vigilant follow-up and uh, is a viable strategy, okay? And as I mentioned before, some of the superficial spreading melanoma takes a really long time to sort of grow. They're not going to be challenged. They're not going to be a problem. And fourth is uh, avoiding this anchoring bias. That is, you're sort of looking at the lesion, you stop, you ignore everything else. And this is a very, very big pitfall, especially in the afternoon, 2.30, you just had your lunch, and you're tired, and you saw 35 patients beforehand. And that's why sometimes it's better just to sit down, talk to them, refocus, okay? And don't be timid in challenging your pathologist. And with that, I thank you. Thank you.